Welcome to the first episode of Tuonen Portis new podcast. I'm your host, Konstantin Tuonihovi. Most of the upcoming content will be in Finnish, but from time to time we will release English content as well. Our guest tonight is Dr. Martin Locker from the Perennial Pyrenees Project. He is a trained archaeologist and researcher living in Andorra with over a decade's experience in the discipline. Dr. Locker's work has been published in several journals and books. Outside of archaeology, he has a long-held fascination for cultural heritage, mountainous places and all things rustic. Greetings, Martin. After that introduction, uh, could you tell me a bit more about your current professional activities in Andorra? Any projects you might want to mention? Sure. I have just finished a monograph, uh, writing a monograph. It still has to be laid out, nothing else. That'll take a while. But it's a monograph based off of about six to seven months of spending my weekends tramping around as much of Andorra as I possibly could looking for and at apotropaic markings carved on rural buildings, specifically door panels and window lintels, entrance bays essentially on the exterior, because it's a very niche topic, obviously, but a great many of these door panels are being discarded and replaced with wooden or metal ones. But essentially what I'm trying to say is the older ones, which bear these markings are being gotten rid of. So it's kind of an attempt to form an archive um, and go a little bit into the kind of potential symbolism using uh, extrapolated comparisons with elsewhere in the Pyrenees and Europe, etc. cetera. Um, so that's really the most recent perennial Pyrenees project. I'm not currently recording any new musical material, though that I'm sure that will change in the next few weeks. And I am writing a new novel off the back of my previous one, but it's unrelated. It's set in rural Britain and it's going into a concept I came up with about six to eight months ago in a in one of my musical productions, I guess you call it, called The Vagabond Trust. So it's looking at a sort of rural English fictional association, really, of travelers and wayfarers and their links with gypsies and that kind of thing and gypsy folklore and this potentially fictional folklore as well so that's kind of what's going on at the moment so a lot <laughs> you are ever so yeah, well, prof- yeah. prophetic got to keep busy who knows uh, when it will all come tumbling down yeah i think uh, that's a topic um, i'm very like a uh, well versed myself at least that's kind of uh, like the hellhound on my trail reason uh, mm-hmm. I try to be as prophetic as I can because at, for example I'm um, 45 years old now and uh, I remember you are some years younger than me but still it's like uh, if you have a mission you're on a mission well it's, it's, it's you know, if you if you have the time you may as well use it productively Could you give us some kind of a backdrop? What's the weather out there? What's the season like? And uh, oh, what's well, your surroundings? In the Pyrenees. Well, actually, last week it snowed quite heavily, but that's kind of melting away a little bit at the moment. That's gonna, it's it's going to snow again next week, and I think that's going to be settling in for the long term over the winter. Uh, it's bloody cold. I live above a little village in the mountains of Andorra, so it's not in the not in the town uh, and there's it's very attractive it's very nice you know you, you walk out your door and within two minutes you can be on a woodland path and away from people which is obviously a very pleasant thing but yeah it's just you know cold at the moment quite dry but it's going to start dumping down properly with snow again next week so we'll see what kind of road chaos that's going to cause <laughs> because well I, mean, i don't know man like it's 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 one of those things here in which the first few instances of snow, despite the fact that it happens every year without fail, but roughly the same time, uh, everyone suddenly forgets how to drive, how to deal with the snow, etc., etc., etc. So it's one of those settling in periods that you just have to learn to live with. Really, it, it's so funny. It, it actually sounds a lot like Finland. We have this uh, 
these uh, yearly problems in the winter with uh, the train traffic and uh, of course when it's snowing a lot there are like uh, many uh, car accidents because people mm. are so stupid that they drive their cars like uh, just directly behind the car uh, in front it's it's annoying but what can you do the funny thing is actually last week um, at the point of recording last week, there are two kind of Catholic holidays. And so the entire, what happens in those times is that you have the majority of Spain, like bookending some enormous long weekend or taking the whole week off and descending on Andorra for their Christmas shopping, etc. Of course, none of these people have any idea how to really deal with kind of snow, etc. So although it wasn't snowing particularly much this year, last year, it's absolutely dumping down at this time. And they all came up and they had no, they had a, kind of like their snow socks tearing off and they have no idea how to drive in the snow or, you know, come across or experience snow. So it's just a complete bedlam of incoming tourist cars at this time. Once next week happens and, you know, that kind of thing, you start getting the skiers coming and they're obviously much more accustomed to snow. Yes. But it's this sort of like, it's the boutique brigade which come up for their, Instagram shots with uh, oh my god look snow oh <gasps> how Christmassy you think, oh, so. yeah, this oh is yeah, this is this is the first world problems of living in the mountain hideaway so <laughs> that's that's the reason I I try to spend uh, most of my time at the cottage near the rural area of uh, Finland it's pretty close where I live and uh, the contrast is just enormous very seldomly you see other people when you are walking the dogs especially at night and it's so delightful. Well, speaking of that, Matt, it's, it sounds slightly ludicrous, I suppose, but I have in my head like an entire temporal dependent map of the best places to walk in Andorra uh, in terms of will there be tourists there? What time of day is the best place to never come across anybody <laughs> at all? So I kind of arrange a lot of my walks around that kind of premise is where can I go with no people and that I'm not going to, uh, you know, fall off the edge of a mountain and die i can relate to that it's like um, it's well worth risk so to speak it's like if, even if oh, it there is, is. The it is. maybe we it's are only, like you know what it's like when you get trapped well you know it's like when you get we want to walk when you get trapped behind five people in front and five people behind yeah. it's like a bloody andrex trail i can only only imagine how annoying that it it, it is in that kind of environment so basically <laughs> alone with nature and then yeah. um, it sounds it sounds quite petulant but i do value uh quiet so. it's interesting that you kind of uh, telepathically uh, answered my next question which was basically how does your rural daily life in andorra differ from the time you lived in the city and uh, i presume you have and at one point of your life lived in some kind of major city uh, Oh yes. So what are well, I what spent are, um, yeah. I spent eight years in in London at university, which is where I did the rigmarole of BA, MA, and, and and the PhD stuff. And I, to be fair, you know, as a young person, not that I'm very old now. I only I'm 36, even though I feel about 80. Um, you know, it's, if you're young, it's perfectly nice, man. But Jesus Christ, there's no way in hell I could go back there now to live. It's, I mean, it sounds quite ridiculous because Andorra is a country which is minuscule. You can drive across across it in roughly about an hour. It has one major town and the rest are essentially, you call them like very small towns or large villages. But I used to live down in the town until a couple of years ago, about well, three years ago now. And you'd hear people go, oh my God, so busy here. Oh, I just can't wait to get back to my apartment in the... I was like, this is busy. What are you talking about? Lo and behold, three years later, is oh, do I have to go into town? There's so many people. Oh, it's so full of. Oh, it's so noisy. It's it's funny how quickly you adapt to to many situations. Yeah, I think that's a, like a very human uh, thing to do. That people get accustomed to pretty much any kind of environment, even kind mm. of uh, maybe. Some persons can get accustomed to some kind of solitary cell, for example, but that would be pretty rough anyway. What do you think are the best perks of the rural life over there? Quiet. I think yeah. quiet, especially now with 
our lives, I mean, not just in terms of like ambient sort of, you know, urban noise, etc. Obviously, living in a rural thing, you can get rid of the ambient, the ambient noise of rural, of, uh, of urban stuff, which is very, very nice. It's very, very important, I think, for a, if you're someone who enjoys their own company, which I do, for better or for worse, it's a great, a great thing to be able to have access to. Of course, there's the other kind of noise, which is all the social media stuff, which wherever you live, it's, that's really up to you to, to kind of switch off from. But I think the peace and quiet, it's the ability to walk outside your door and within two minutes, you're among trees and pastures and that kind of thing. It's a very underestimated medicine, I think, for all sorts of, if you feel depressed or you feel in any way kind of negative, it's a great karma and a great perspective giver, which is something uh, I think I lost you. Uh, can you hear me? There was some kind of oh, audio gosh. glitch. Yeah, the, the recording. I don't know what. Yeah, I think your uh, voice became glitchy, and uh, then it then there was just quiet. Yes. Okay. I think that happened last time too, but uh, it's it's yeah, recording. I'm not so. sh- I do wonder if. Yeah. Um, at the moment, there is a slight internet issue because yes. we do have in andorra a shit system rural life man do you sometimes churn for a simple more tribal life and what i mean by this is you already live in rural uh, environment when compared to the city life of course would you be willing to kind of upgrade that experience to for example the time travel to some um, 200 years ago or something, back to the OG li- Andorran lives? It's a difficult question to answer because, well, firstly, I th- nowadays we have that term tribal flung around an awful lot, usually, I have to say, by, by grifters uh, on the internet who have this idea of tribe being essentially a collection of friends who drink together, uh, mess around with motorbikes and have the occasion of boxing match. I, so I, I don't really want to use the word tribe in that case. And I think Andorra in terms of going back 200 years is, is a slightly special case in the sense that really before 1970, 1960 here, it where because in 1960s, 1970s, you had a sort of, not discovery, but the starting of a kind of influx of tourism and money, essentially, uh, for better or for worse in various cases. But before then, it was very low population density, very, well, I should choose my words carefully, quite poor, quite poor, um, reliant on pastoralism, so cattle and livestock, really, smuggling and other, I guess, towards the, in the 19th century, we had an iron industry here. But it, it's, you're talking about a very difficult life, physically speaking. You can just, you, you can make, you know, all sorts of adjustments for the benefits of community differences, etc. But it, it, it was tough, very tough, uh, and not necessarily something which would be envied. I do think they should, on a separate note, I do think they should keep a lot of the cultural aspects still today. And they seem to be being replaced with a kind of generic wish for uh, luxury prestige, which I think is a mistake. But to go back to your question, um, honestly, I think that I think that the best sort of time to be living with a moderate, comfortable income, because if you're poor at any stage in history, it's not great, let's be frank, but to be alive with a kind of comfortable or moderate income, I think in the late 19th century was probably one of the best times, Uh, at least in terms of, for me, the cultural aspects and the intellectual aspects uh, and I say that because you had this strange, well, strange, this rather lovely crossover point 
between the past and the future in that way, in which you had the very, 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 very tangible and present daily life existence of the continuity of centuries of cultural identity and cultural practices and all sorts of aspects which are pretty deeply rooted. But you also had the emergence of various industrial, well, we had industrial technologies, etc. And this created a quite a febrile point in which there was a great sense of intellectual freedom, hobbyist, antiquarianism, um, research, all sorts of things, intellectually speaking, which were quite boundless in terms of their freedom to go and do and research and look and see and record and write and express. Um, and I think and that you also had that time of Europe where you had the kind of, you still had the definitive existence of almost relict feudal states combined with emerging nation states. And this creates a very, very interesting dynamic um, and an interplay between hyper-regional cultures and emergent national cultures. And I think that was a very interesting time um, to be alive. And even aesthetically speaking, for me, I think it was pretty good. Pretty good, man. Of course, you can, the further on you go, you start to get into some very uh, unpleasant territory. But that particular point, I think, was is is some is something which, if you're talking about tribal, well, we don't have to talk about tribal really, yeah. but in terms of maintaining community and the social contract which existed between various classes and various people, I think that was a pretty good model, as it was. Okay, I, I used the word tribal, and uh, after mm. after I used the term, I understood myself that uh, uh, if I'm referring to something tribal, it would like uh, be further than some 200 years ago. Maybe it's like a um, town life or some kind of uh, like a folk life, but uh, tribal yeah. life must go go so much further down the history than people were actually in the direct uh, uh, sense of the term tribal. It's well, maybe... I mean, it's a, it's a very, it's a very, I don't know, you see, because if you're talking about tribal life, I mean, are we restricting tribal as we would kind of understand it in the hunter-gatherer sense, which yeah. is the kind of predominant image people have with the Neolithic revolution and the emergence of settled agriculture and the, the beginnings of more structured hierarchical societies the element of tribalism tends to give way to a more permanent hierarchy in a way and, and and of course a hierarchy which is dependent on labor necessarily rather than uh, or, or labor as in terms of if you are entering into priesthood or warfare or aristocratic uh, leadership and that kind of thing when I, when I think when people use the word tribal, I think they're, what they're really meaning is a is not so much the kind of hunter gatherer thing because let's face it, very few of us are, are capable of entering into that state of being now, or at least without a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of preparation. I think when people talk about tribal, they're they're, they're more. Uh, they're, 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 they're kind of looking for a, a more connected, broader family, or at least small-scale community, which is yes. reasonably self-sufficient and interdependent. I think that's more where people are going with the word tribal, which I think is a perfectly laudable, especially in the face of today's ultra expansive society, where people have a tendency to feel lost or atomized atomized exactly yeah. exactly i think that i can totally understand the tribal aspect personally speaking i'm quite antisocial so i don't <laughs> the idea of being around a lot of around some you know a, a, a certain you know 
relatively medium-sized group of people all the time. It doesn't particularly appeal. Um, but I can certainly understand the reasons why people yearn for that. There's a, they should, there's a difficulty there, of course, looking back at things with rose-tinted glasses. There was still interpersonal drama, strife, political problems. I mean, you know, all these kind of human yeah. problems. So a lot of these tribal things now are based on friendship groups rather than family. That's so you true, can choose yes. who's yes. in and yeah. who's out. Whereas if you're in one of the original, you know, the original format tribes, I mean, your family, maybe you don't get on with your yeah. family. Like a blood family. Kind of stuck. Yeah. yeah, you're kind of stuck. So I think people should be a little bit more careful or at least a little bit more aware of what they're describing when they're talking about, you know, oh, me and my tribe, you and your tribe is your, you and your buddies, which is a friendship group, which is great. But, you know, having a back patch or whatever ritual you've kind of come up with, just, you know, hold back on the labels a little bit. Which is which actually is something I'd apply to most people for everything. Hold back on the labels a little bit, but we can get into that later. Now that you mentioned that the uh, life of the Pyrenees was, of course, hard and maybe harder than the life of the basic, for example, Spanish people at the time, say 200, 300 years ago, because of the terrain, which is, of course, very like, uh, how do you say, not hostile per perhaps, but like challenging terrain. rugged. I would say I would say that um, obviously it depends where you are in Spain. If you're looking at down in the kind of Sierra, I mean, life's pretty. Spain is a very curious social history in that way because I won't go into it because we haven't got time. But it re it retained a I would disc I would say a, a very feudal arrangement for a very very long time, very very long time. And the Spanish peasantry, I mean, that was that was hard. I mean, really, really hard life. I mean, there's a reason why anarchy, well, Spain in the Civil War was the only place really where anarchists got any kind of foothold. And so it's, I mean, but returning to the Pyrenees, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's a mountainous terrain. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, uh, it has its lush valleys and splendid summers, but it also has some pretty severe winters. And, you know, much like any mountainous territory, I mean, you have to deal with that as the best way as possible. Yeah, it's it's you know it's it's the mountains, man. I mean, it's 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 difficult, and it's it, there is a great tendency to look at you know chocolate box Christmas kind of thing as this kind of very <laughs> lovely, snowy, glimmering landscape, and it's very very attractive. But you know, it will kill you if you don't make the proper kind of provisions. I mean, in, yeah. in Andorra, for example, looking at the winter, I was talking to some people about this, and they remember like their grandparents saying that they were as ch as we're talking like young adolescents sent over into france during the winter away to to, to work because firstly there was no work to be done in andorra because it, there was no agriculture because it's winter and secondly they could actually earn some money because there was no way to earn money in andorra during that time and then bring it back to the family in the spring so it's tough you know okay, do, do you think that um the Pyrenees are a kind of a ur folk, hardy folk. For example, the people who uh, originally inhabited uh, Finland must have been somewhat crazy in the sense that uh, the climate is at times pretty harsh over there with a, with a long mm. wind. And uh, okay, it's not that um, less over here. I, I mean, in the, in the sense that um, the winter can be like... Uh, yeah, it can it can pretty easily kill you if you don't have the proper preparations. Well, yeah, I mean, you have some extraordinary the, winters. The, the spirit of the people, how would you define the spirit of the uh, Pyrenean people? Well, they're, uh, they're quite obviously independent because you have to be. Uh, but that also ties into the idea of the Pyrenees um, as a not... I wouldn't go so far as to say a separate entity to France and Spain, but certainly if you consider that in the, it's only in the mid 17th century that with the Treaty of the Pyrenees, you had a kind of a hard border between France and Spain running down the Pyrenees. Before then, the territories were very, very shifting. And given the, given the sheer volume of 
valleys and hidden, I suppose you could say like hidden folds in the Pyrenees. Um, and the arrangement with the pastures and all that kind of thing. There was a lot of traffic up, up and down the Pyrenees from Pyrenean pastoralists. And of course, smuggling and all sorts of things were going on and still do actually. Um, and of course, that if you combine that kind of method of living with things like hyper-regionalism, uh, the phenomenon of, obviously the big example is the Basques, but I mean, you have other areas like Huesca, um, Andorra to a degree, um, the Bayonne, all these areas have a very, very, very strong regional identity because they were not, uh, I would say, they have a history of being a kind of hinterland which wasn't seen or wasn't exploited as effectively as other lower, more fertile or easier areas in France and Spain which border them. So you have the Pyrenees as this very self-reliant ecosystem, essentially, both economically and um, spiritually, I guess you'd say. Not to say that they obviously we have people from low pastures, kind of the Pyrenees for high pastures, so it wasn't like a, it's a mess, is what I'm trying to say, in terms of like, it had arrangements, obviously, with neighboring regions, but also it had interpersonal relationships with other places in the Pyrenees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you have a people which are very, very independent spirited. They're not taking kindly to being told what to do. And if you think about the archetypal <laughs> industry of the Pyrenees as smuggling, really, that gives you a flavor of the kind of people that inhabit the Pyrenees. There is a very much a self-reliance not a not a huge regard for the regulations of the adjoining mainlands um, so much and it's it, there's a very independent flavor to the various regions of the pyrenees i'd say it's like uh, the people and the territory is kind of uh, liminal but we can get to that in the second phase mm. of this interview just i wanted to Make a point here, Flag it up. but that's that's coming. And now that we are we are in this uh, topic, I would ask you that um, the local tr folk traditions they have this ritual mm. garb with animal motifs such as bears. Actually, there's something uh, which I I noticed, like uh, say around uh, more than maybe, maybe it was like a bit over two years ago. I discovered your Instagram page, Perennial Pyrenees, and uh, I would advise the audience to check out. And uh, you had this uh, interesting old photograph of a person, a man, probably in a, some kind of uh, uh, horned suit. I think it's it's some kind of, uh, of horned, horned like a beast. Probably uh, a bull. I think it, in German they had this rouse nut and uh, this kind of uh, festivals with with people uh, dressing up as in in animal garb, mm. like power animals. Mm. Uh, that's quite interesting uh, topic. Could you tell us more about um, the local shamanism and the witchcraft side of things? In the Pyrenees, you have uh, quite a few representations around candle, <clears throat> sorry, candle mass, the end of February. Or in Fe it depends obviously on the Gregorian calendar, but around late February of these what they call the fest, festos or fetetos or basically baldos or bear festivities essentially is what they are. Now, before I describe them, it's it's interesting to note that there are the theories behind the origins of these bear festivals are complex because they're obviously very difficult to prove. There are some people who think that there is a broader European origin for them in the sort of Siberian areas. There is a theory by which has some traction, but I'm not going to say whether it's more likely or not because we don't know. <clears throat> but there is a theory that ties directly into the Pyrenees, actually, uh, regarding the bear festivals and their spread out into. Europe, because if you look at various places in Europe, right from Germany to England to France, over into Sardinia, I mean, into 
Romania and other places as well, you have these very similar festivities uh, following similar narratives and similar emphases, emphasis on the bear. Now, there is the idea that in the in the last kind of large, for want of a better word, the large kind of ice age that covered Europe in ice, there, there is the thing called the Franco-Cantabrian Refuge, which was effectively a portion of the northern Pyrenees around the Basque country, which had more favorable uh, living conditions. And that there is this idea that a lot of peoples from neighboring regions gathered up in that refuge for the duration of the ice sheets being at full force. And as they started to retreat, the people diffused back into Iberia and into France and over, you know, diffusing over back into kind of repopulating areas of Europe, which had, which were, which were under ice, which was now retreating. Now there is the idea that within the Basque country, for various etymological reasons, I, get, I can't really get into it because I haven't got it off the top of my head, but there is this idea that in the Basque country, there is this very primal bear kind of cult, which sounds rather extravagant, but if you look at the, the Paleolithic um, sites in caves, etc., uh, there is certainly a great deal of bear symbolism in the Paleolithic within the Pyrenees. Not exclusively, but over-representation, one might say, considering the distribution in other sites. So if this is the case in the Basque country, it, at large, not talking about necessarily the, the now political area, but the kind of broader Bascoid regions, um, and it's interesting to note as well that one of the, that people, some people think that looking at toponyms, including in Andorra, there is certainly a strong Basque presence uh, linguistically in some of these toponyms right across the Pyrenees. So the original kind of Pyrenean communications may have been the kind of early Bascoid. But anyway, returning to the ice, um, that as these people uh, kind of diffused out from the kind of broader Pyrenean Basque region, they took with them this bear symbolism in some way. And that found its way of manifesting in various festivities across Europe as they kind of went into the, into the mainland once again. Uh, that's a theory by a a professor called she's in Ohio State University, I think, or she was last time I checked, called Rosalind Frank, and she's done a lot of work on this. Uh, so I advise people to go and look at her research if you're interested in that kind of thing. But within the Pyrenees, we have these bear festivals still yes. ongoing. There's one in Andorra, there's a very, very famous one in Prastimolo, which is not far from here in, in the French Pyrenees. There's numerous examples up and down. There's the processions, which aren't strictly speaking at the same time of year, but have a similar ethos in the Basque country, uh, whose names I cannot pronounce off the top of my head, Gentiliac or something like that. Um, but there's all this representation of uh, largely kind of bearish symbolism. And in some of the more structured ones we see in Prastamolo, for example, which is very, very famous, similar here in Andorra and other places as well in Huesca in the Aragonese Pyrenees, there's this narrative of a bear, which, as I recall, it sort of attempts to steal a woman who's usually called some derivation of Rosa, and then it takes the woman into its lair and it either attempts to essentially rape her or it gets stopped before that point. But in either case, it is then taken by hunters out and then it is either killed or it is shaved. Now, what's interesting about the shaving aspect interpretation wise is that this is seen as in some way uh, civilizing the bear. Now, what's another interesting aspect of that is that firstly, there is a substantially important piece of French folklore, which is very, very famous, which again, I can't recall, it's called Jean, Jean de l'Ours, I think, in which it has many derivations, as always folk tales do, but the general thing of, of this is that the boy, Jean, is 
conceived from the union of a bear and a woman in his cave. And he has all sorts of like big strength and becomes a blacksmith and blah, blah, blah. blah. Blacksmith also has a huge amount of this, uh, folkloric significance in the Pyrenees as well as other places. But also there's, a, there's this popular idea, I believe it's present in Basque mythology, but also in other areas of Pyrenees as well, that the bear is like a human when it's amongst bear hunters. It, it, they all say it looks so much like a human when it's caught and skinned. So there's this kind of connection between the bear and the man, uh, physiologically speaking. And there's all sorts of other things going on, which are, I can't really get into. Um, if you read my book, Tears of Piren, uh, you'll be able to check it out in chapter two. Um, but there's all these other aspects which chime in as well, which are very, very uh, curious. But there's definitely this, in, in the Pyrenees, there's this very strong resonance still with the bear festivals and the idea of the bear of course candle mass around february is when typically speaking you have the, the bear uh, coming out of hibernation so that ties in nicely as well but yeah i mean it's also just i think only a few only like last week or something they finally got unesco i think to oh. attribute all of these bear festivities under a kind of umbrella piece of intangible cultural heritage which is very good because it means they will be protected and yeah, uh, exist in perpetuity yeah. as well. Yeah, exactly. In uh, Finland and in the Finnish mythology, the bear also is uh, like a very mm. important figure and uh, maybe in Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. many European countries, of course, it's like... Uh, I mean, I, I think I read in, in in Finland, there's this, there's some taboos of, well, traditionally speaking amongst bear hunters, there's taboos of how you may or may not kill the bear like you can't just like sneak up on it, it has to be uh, not a fair fight obviously but there has to be some level of of um of chance given to the bear it can't it, it doesn't deserve being snuck up on and shot in the back basically there's all sorts of things from around the world i mean even like korea like with the anku and the, not yeah, no, not korea i think it's japan actually but all sorts of places around the world where the bear has this kind of reverence attached to it in yes. various forms it might have something to do with the fact that the bear is probably the apex predator in the, mm, in the, in the nature in, in Europe, at least. It's an interesting uh, species, of course, mm. and um, it, it has this like a kind of a mill of side when it's uh, eating berries and then it can just kill you <laughs> if it, it's protecting its uh, offspring. And uh, it's no wonder that that bear is such a, an important figure in the mythological side of things in the past now that there is renaissance of this uh, folk horror movie gender like uh, mm. the classic uh, vicar man the vicar man is of course the old old movie and then there's the remake but for there is this ari astes who is of the hereditary in fame uh, he had this uh, film called uh, midsummer and uh, for example there was yeah. this witch what do you think of this? What are your influences in the fiction, say, movies, books, and art? Well, I, I always have a large soft spot for the 1970s, especially British um, sort of horror films and that kind of thing, largely because of the aesthetics, um, the textures, the themes, kind of. They have this, I don't know how to put it. It's It's very English in its sort of, eerie yet slightly tongue-in-cheek but also quite serious in some ways but I, I very much enjoy you know the old kind of like blood and satan's claw and you know uh wicker man night of the demon that kind of thing i i enjoy those uh, tremendously the modern folk horror i haven't seen a huge amount what i've seen i haven't been completely convinced by I think I'm not sure whether it's because I have a particular enjoyment of. I, I'm no cinephile, so this is like not. This sounds like I'm being kind of cinematographically snobbish, but it, it's just the aesthetic I enjoy is the kind of texture of the film. You know, yes. in the seventies, that kind of that that it's that grainy texture. I think, in a sense, the the modern stuff is too cleanly shot. Some of it's, I mean, like a film in England, I I, I enjoyed. I thought that was, that was very good, but. I, I'm also not, I'm not a great fan 
of the way in which a lot of the modern folk horror seems to be politically charged. No. I don't, I don't see the need to inject kind of not terribly subtle political messages into it. Oh, yeah. Um, you know what I mean? I, I don't, I don't see that as relevant or necessary. Uh, but I, I also haven't seen a tremendous amount, so it might be I'm just, I've just seen it wrong once, of course. Um, but if I want to watch folk horror, essentially that kind yeah. of thing, I'll go to the, the late fifties, late sixties, seventies. Yeah. yeah, I completely understand. Also, the soundtracks were the soundtracks were tremendous. Man. But if you I... go to like um, um oh god, Living Dead at Manchester Morgue, that kind of like seventies, uh, slightly psychedelic. Italian almost funk stuff and it, it's just it's tremendous man it's really really good whenever there is some kind of renaissance of of some like a particular topic or or like a gender uh, for example the folk horror it's like um, it's it's pretty hard maybe to outdo the original you know stuff because mm. it's like uh, they they always stem from something I, I just have noticed that it's it's a growing trend Nowadays, at least it seems to oh, be. It is, but you know, yeah. it, 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 all, all this stuff now. There's a there's a great emphasis now on that kind of like cottage core. I just love crochet kind of thing, and it's like okay, great. I don't want to get too cynical on it because I go on for ages about it. But this is you, you know what I mean, man. This is yeah. kind of like oh, I'm just I'm just so interested in folklore. Oh well, have you read blah 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 blah? You know, like the old folklore collections from people. That, Oh no, man, that's boring. I like, uh, you know, I there's this great Instagram page, which I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, man. <laughs> I mean, the, the idea of like the depth of interest in these things is pretty yeah. is pretty minimal, I think, on most people. Not any lay person has any kind of uh, understanding or gnosis about that kind of thing. Yet it still exists. For example, in in any kind of uh, topic, there is the deep end, and there is the superficial like the easygoing, low effort end of things. And uh, yeah. I think, I, I hope this interview gives them um, inspiration to people to do their own research, to delve deeper into these topics, because there's so much to dig. And as you pretty much understand, there's an art Well, I, I, I yeah. should say that I'm, a lot of these festivities, I mean, not only the Bear Fest is, is an important one, but there's lots of other things throughout the year which are still engaged with and are, are engaged with as a kind of party or enjoyment or, or or a festive bit of fun and that's perfectly fine you know i i i'm not at all saying that you know people need to they can't practice unless they understand the <laughs> no, 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 no. it just but just just keep it going just keep it going, you know, and if people want to go into it and, and really look into it, great. If not, fine. But for God's sake, just keep it going. Because once it's gone, it's gone. I mean, it's it's much like these so many things about culture. Is I'm not going to go into it too much because I could go on, as I said, for a long time. But there's a tremendous willingness to sacrifice culture at the altar of economics. And economics bounces back, man. The culture, I mean, once it's gone, it's very difficult to resuscitate on a meaningful level. Okay, much of this uh, old heritage is gone. Like without the efforts of the people who try to preserve it, preserve it, such as you, of course. And um, well, I mean, yeah. it's, I you know, there's 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 a large, well, comparatively, of course, we're talking comparatively large debate about all the kind of Raunacht uh, celebrations and things where they've been over commercialized. Yeah, you know, and to some degree, you know, I can see that if you could say if it's reduced to like a, a ski town parade then it's a bit of a shame. But on the other hand, at least it's still being done and there's still money flowing into it to keep yeah. it going. Because it can always, it can, if it, as long as it's still there, it can always be, you know, twisted back or, or onto its original sense or, you know, practiced in a more authentic fashion or whatever. But at least it's still there. Yeah. I mean, once the problem is once it stops pulling people's attention, these things tend to get cut or if they see it's too dangerous or whatever and once it's cut it's you know it's very difficult to put it back in that's so unfortunate but what can you do except but, for doing what you do of course and uh, well just record it man yeah record it as much as you can 
put it somewhere, put it in the archives, have it, have it, have it as a resource people can go back and see at least, at least. Uh, I think that's very, very important. I very much agree. Um, one last question for the uh, first first phase of this interview. Stay tuned because uh, this is only the first half, and uh, we are going to embark to the part two, the Numinous territory. But before that, uh, I must ask you about your musical side of uh, perennial pyrenees project <laughs> um, i already lost count of how many recordings you have released thus far and uh, i might add that they are completely free to download from your mm -hmm. perennial pyrenees dot com website i have especially appreciated the blend of mellow drone synths and the ambient sounds such as singing of birds and i saw that of course like uh, field recordings you have used what is your process for producing these albums, which are like uh, so prophetic? At times it feels like uh, you are like uh, perhaps a man possessed such as myself. But uh, uh, how do you say, go about this? Some would say prolific. Yeah. Some would say prolific. Others would say uh, far too much. I think it's like a hundred. I don't know. It's just, just shy of 120 now. But basically, okay, so to give a little bit of backstory to it, Essentially, in 2019, I believe, I wanted to do something Pyrenees-focused, which was, you know, I mean, okay, I've, I've been, it sounds so trite, but a massive fan of music for, I don't know, God, 20, 25 years now, all sorts of different things. And I always wanted to do my own stuff, but I never really had the right time or place or aptitude or anything like that. Not that I think I have a tremendous aptitude now, but so 2019, I said, right, fuck it, let's just do it. I thought, well, if we're here, it really, because I really, really love things like Sturmpecht and Jägerblut and that kind of thing, especially those sort of like mixture of field recordings and kind of rural-esque atmospheres and folklore and all that kind of thing. So I thought, well, that's the kind of thing I enjoy. Let's see if we can do something along that kind of vein to do with the Pyrenees, because I'm here. You know, this is what I write about. This is what I, my, my kind of like spare time is really devoted to. So I came up with Pyrenewman, so-called, because uh, people sometimes think it's Pyre Newman, but it's Pyrenewman, P-Y-R, colon, Newman, because it's the Newman of the Pyrenees. So I thought, well, let's try that. And I did a couple of things with that. And then I thought, well, I also really enjoy <laughs> lots of, you know, uh, music from different parts of the world. And I would love to put out little kind of curated collections, some manipulated into like chopped sample loops or others with more kind of longer, longer authentic uh, recordings of different parts of the world so i started doing that with mons newman and then i was like well i also really enjoy uh, uh you know they're kind of like looking at the kind of more kind of folk horror british landscape english folklore that kind of thing so i thought well let's just have also have a project based on that and that was britta newman and so for a couple of years basically those three projects kind of went along their own uh, lines of theme you know, the sounds were quite different I would say Pyrenean is probably the most varied in terms of it does things from pure kind of like chopped and skewed field recording to black metal to God knows what um, synthesized ambient stuff and other things in between like folk, folk music as well and whatever. Uh, Mons Newman, I've tried to keep more strict in terms of offering people kind of curated experiences of particular cultures within lar almost largely, sorry to say, relying on authentic recordings from that culture. Britta Newman, that's his own little kind of beast, which is much more kind of a mixture of M.R. James and Aquarian uh, eeriness and other things which kind of tie thematically into that kind of folkloric, sometimes very kind of romantic, others more kind of dark, but whatever. So we had those three. And then I think, uh, God, I don't even remember, man. Like, I think at the end of last year, I started up the Hexafoil project, which is more kind of black metal focused, but 
it more kind of how to put it exclusively or more kind of tightly black metal but it has a lot of influences from like i don't know what like 70s crowd stuff and you know other things as well basically i wanted to make some black metal which was not terribly serious in terms of its appearance but had that kind of like cheeky f uh, folk darkness to it like i called it like i called it quite tongue-in-cheek like impish black metal uh, because it's meant to be a little bit kind of like you know a little bit tongue-in-cheek but i still mean it to be good but i don't i'm not going down the whole kind of like you know satan world destruction kind of route because i think that's massively overdone and tired and boring so those are the kind of four principal now projects that exist when i put my stuff out there are a couple other things but they're kind of very much one-offs or whatever the process of recording uh, is very very um basic i have garage band which has an array of synthesizers i have my computer keyboard not a keyboard keyboard but a computer <laughs> keyboard yes <clears throat> and i have my phone which has a voice recorder which i do all the field recordings or recording real instruments or vocals or whatever so that's how i make what i make basically of course i use samples a lot i chop them up in garage band and, and mess around with pre you know, uh, configurations etc 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 but yeah that's, 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 i didn't have like a i wouldn't call it, it's not a home studio it's just the computer and my telephone's voice recorder basically um field recordings in nature same thing take the phone out record save it send it to my computer put it in garage band there we are so it's I, I like I like that because it's simple, but, and also uh, in a way because it's quite constrained. It allows me to kind of like really push the amount of manipulation I can use with the program itself, which I now know how to use properly. And also, I like the fact that it's reasonably DIY. Everything I put up, everything I produce, is first digital and for free on my website. Some get put on tape by uh my main uh my main tape man is uh under the dark soil and god love him for for putting them out on tape thank you yang i can't i can't thank you enough for that uh but the vast majority are digital only and free on my website you can do whatever the hell you want with it basically and i like that diy thing that it's it's very much it's the same thing actually with uh with the, with the projects writing is of course I have an archaeological background and university stuff and blah 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 blah. But the real point comes down to if you want to do it, you can just you can go and do it. Everyone yeah, has like... the capacity now. Yeah, everyone has the capacity now with computers or whatever to if they're really interested in something, they can go and do it. And so it's up to you to invest the time. But apart from that, you can go and do it. I have noticed that my artist friends who are who are really like uh, doing things with a passion, it's like uh, they are constantly creating because there's nobody stopping them. For example, it's mm. the same with me. As long as I have the uh, inspiration, and um, we can we can speak more where that ca comes from in the next phase. But but it's like uh, as long as it's it's with me, I will do the art even if i have like a one finger so to speak it's like uh, there's nobody stopping me and uh, it's it's also something like uh, the true artist needs to do in order to kind of mentally and uh, or, or spiritually survive it's it's not an option to not to do well it's, i i i wouldn't call myself a true artist yeah, I didn't um, mean it that that in any kind of no, 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 like no. A arrogant sense. No, 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 no. It's not, not that. No, no, I, I'm saying I'm not. I'm, yeah. no, I'm just saying that it's it's a great pleasure for me. It's a great hobby of mine. And I think that obviously some turn out better than others. And I think I've done, I think what I've done, uh, is, a significant amount of it is perfectly reasonable. And some, I think, personally speaking it is very good but it's you know it's it's just it's my pleasure and i think that it, the, the the enjoyable thing as well about about doing some of them is that i can tie them into the pyrenean research in a way 
and other aspects, other things, I can branch out into some of like fiction aspects that I write about or or whatever. It, but it, it's all world building in a sense, yeah. and it's all it's it's a great pleasure to be able to curate and put out things which I enjoy and I feel that they at the risk of sounding utterly pretentious, they kind of express something which I feel is important or an, an atmosphere which I find particularly resonant or whatever. But you know, this 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 I, I know I know some people who um, talk a lot about making an album and they have, you know, a thousand pedals and all yeah. this kind of thing. All right. But man, it's been like two years and you ain't done shit. Why not? Let's do it. You have the time. I mean, most people have the time. It's just how they decide to use it. So That's true. if you really have this idea of like, I, I think a lot of people, you know, a lot, but I think definitely the case with some people, they have this, they enjoy the, they enjoy the self, self-labeling of artists more than the actual work. And I, I find it surprising when you come across those kind of people because it's like, well, you have you have the ability, you have everything, far more so than me. Just do it. Just do it. I mean, now with all the record labels that are available, for example, or whatever, I mean, you'll probably find somewhere to put it out if you want to put it out like on a physical format. But even if not, just have it out and let people enjoy it or not. But at least you know you've done it. And you've pr- I think a lot of it comes down to that, actually, in my case, is proving to myself, whether it be books or music, uh, that, that I can do it. From what I have done with myself, I mean, like my own personal art and the art projects I have been involved in, it's all, always as kind of a, like a personal experience firsthand. Hmm. And, and, and the end product is also I, I don't mean in it in any kind of arrogant sense is your own legacy. It's like a, that's that's up to other people if they find that interesting or not. But it's something you leave behind uh, when you like well, exactly uh, exactly exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yes. And I really I really think that it's if you can, then I think it's very nice to know that as you bow out of this world. You've left something, you know, to some degree beautiful in your stead when you go. Like an artistic expression of yourself, your unique, unique, uh, like, um, yeah, uh, yeah, take on the world. Exactly, yeah. because everyone has, well, not everybody, but I mean, a vast majority of people have, <laughs> you know, things inside them which are interesting or valuable or some experience yeah. or whatever. And I think it's, you know, it's, why not? Yeah. Why not? You have the time, you have the ability, you have the stuff. I mean, just just, just, just do it. It's not, it's not like a, of course, there are certain artistic people who are on another level or whatever. But a lot, I would say, a lot of them aren't separate beings. You know, they're, they're not a separate species. You know, just, just, just do it. Put it out. Why not? It's your gnosis, so to speak. It's like, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's. I think it's really something everyone should do if they have the capability. But uh, at the end of this um, first phase, I would like to stand out my personal favorite of uh, Pure Numen. It's called the Traveler from Tauret, where under a wasn't. Mm-hmm. It's a story about the traveler arrived at the Japanese airport with a strange passport bearing the origin of Taured, a country he claimed had existed over a thousand years ago. And uh, this is uh, this is like, a, I think this is a, a special album, even by your standards. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah and, it's, it's uh, even I, even in the rather eccentric collection. It's, uh, yeah, it's I, I would normal. advise our audience to check that one out and also your prophylic uh, back catalog over at perennialpyrenees.com. Our discussion will continue in the second part of this interview, which will be released soon. We will delve deep in such intriguing concepts as Tenius Loci, aka the spirit of the place, the liminal, or occultism, and the nominos. Stay tuned for Pyre Newman's track, 
Arrival Collision from the EP The Traveler from Taurid, where Andorra wasn't. Good night. It's July 1954. A hot day. A man arrives at Tokyo Airport in Japan. He's of Caucasian appearance and conventional looking. But the officials are suspicious. On checking his passport, they see that he hails from a country called Tao. The passport looks genuine, except for the fact that there is no such country as Tao at well. At least in our dimension. The man is then given a map and asked to point out his country. The man immediately points to the area occupied by the Principality of Andorra. The man says that his country has been in existence for 1000 years and is a little puzzled why his country is called Andorra on the map. The man argues with the customs officers for a long time and refuses to give in. He is also carrying currencies of different countries. Probably because he has made several business trips. The mystery man shares other details like the company for which he was working and the hotel where he will be staying. Officials find out that the company which he mentions exists in Tokyo but not in Tao. Similarly, the hotel he mentions does exist but hotel employees inform them that no such booking was made. This prompts officers to take the man into custody for further interrogation. Officers are suspicious that he might be a criminal and confiscate his documents and personal belongings. The officers put the mystery man in a nearby hotel whilst they conduct their investigation. And they record his interrogation. In which he talks about his country Tao and which occupies the area of Andorra. Its history and present status prompting officers to wonder if he is lying or perhaps from another dimension with an alternative history.